Live above the grave, none is safe. I see the pain on the mother's face, a ton of grace. It's what she showed as they took away her firstborn. She didn't break, she didn't look away because of race. They said her life wasn't valuable, but that was fake. They said her womb create capital, but that was rape. They say because she blacked it, it's impossible to be racist, but they assume the racism is logical. We know better. We know meadows, no rose petals, hiding in the shadows like Wesley Snipes and Mo Better. They play oppression Olympics, looking for gold medals. We don't settle. You know, a long time ago, being crazy meant something. Nowadays, everybody's crazy. On, on, on. Keep on, on, float on. on, no fear of time. Float on, on, float. Ladies and gentlemen. Mississippi Kingdom, Part 6, Chickasaw, The Unconquered, The Unconquerable. Now, as I start here, I'm going to say, to this day, they definitely earned the name. So we start with the question, how do you win against the unconquerable? Oh, and off top, guys, I'm trying a new presentation format because when I put all my videos on uh, YouTube, it gets glitchy. So I promise myself, if you guys say you want the videos in, you know, I usually have the videos playing in the backgrounds, in the comments, I try to figure out how to smooth out the bandwidth. But for now, on this one, I'm going to just do straight pictures. Remember, I'm out in the country. I don't get that good uh, internet all the time. So notable in DeSoto's 1540 expedition through North America before his death was his interaction with the Chickasaw. The Chickasaw settled on the east of the Mississippi, near the heads of the Tombigbee, Mobile, and Yazoo Rivers, had a complex culture that extended over a huge expanse of land. On this map, you'll see where DeSoto interacted with the Chickasaw near the area of Tuscaloosa's influence, where the Alabama and Sashuma tribes were at the time as well. So you see down here, you got the Chickasaw and the Sashuma right there, right next to the Alabama. And this is uh, DeSoto's route. When they talk about it, they actually call it the Little Ice Age. Just to show it wasn't an isolated event. At the bottom, you'll see the temperature chart. This was real. I think I want some music. So apparently, DeSoto stayed in one of the Chickasaw towns near Tupelo, Mississippi, at a place called Old Fields. Chickasaw Old Fields is near modern-day Madison County, Alabama. That winter was one of the coldest on record in the southeast in 1540, headed into 1541. When they talk about that nowadays, they call it the Little Ice Age. Just to show it wasn't an isolated event at the bottom, you see the temperature chart. That was real. All the way into the 17th century, there were glaciers in the Great Lakes. Iberville said he could hide his canoe behind one of the glaciers. They were so big. He was using the glaciers to hide from the arrows they were shooting at him. There was even droughts due to the cold all the way down to Arkansas, which Arkansas, which would have been a good reason why a lot of people abandoned Cahokia, as they say, even though they didn't really abandon Cahokia. We'll get to that later. But a lot of people did move further south towards Moundville, which I touched on in MK5. Remember, this is the same time Cahokia was going through what they're calling this collapsing, and people were expanding out in different areas, all the way down to the Yucatan, into the Maya and Mexica territories, there were documented droughts. Even in Africa, there was snow in the mountains of Ethiopia and reports of cooling to the tune of an average one degree Celsius. So when DeSoto said it was cold that winter, it was cold. So keep in mind, though this was after the Battle of Mobile, the Chickasaw knew who these Spanish were. And they knew what they did. So they were worried about them, but they helped them through the winter. Today, this Chickasaw village has a site marker on it along the Natchez Trace Parkway at milepost 261.8 in Tupelo, Mississippi. 
This is also the site of that Battle of Akia we talked about, Mississippi Kingdom 5 with Red Shoes. We'll touch on that also today. And also, this is one of the villages the Nache came to to get help from the Chickasaw during the conflicts between the French and the Nache that also involved the Choctaw. Now, at the time, DeSoto ran across them in 1540. The Chickasaw were at least number 3,000 across 50 towns. This is also where Pontotoc, the last fort was, where they signed the treaty in 1832. This site, where DeSoto found itself, is not only a monumental historic site, but it's a monumental prehistoric site. So in the spring of 1541, when DeSoto demanded 200 strong Chickasaw to carry his supplies, the Chickasaw were ready and prepared. Just for perspective, remember the Choctaw and Chickasaw origin story has them coming from west to east. So this village, Old Fields, was actually one of the two sites given that name. This abandoned site village was the one further to the west of Mississippi. By then, the Chickasaw were already a broader chiefdom, expanding from north Mississippi, north of the Choctaw, northwest Alabama, north of the Oconee, and southwest Kentucky and west Tennessee, shared with the Cherokee and other groups that would be known later as the Creek. They had already prepared to deal with DeSoto and had moved everything of importance away from where DeSoto was. So early morning in March of 1541, the Chickasaw caught them while they were sleeping and burned the entire encampment to the ground. This method of attack meant they only lost a few warriors and unlike the Battle of Mobile with Tuscaloosa, the women and children were already far away from the situation. The Chickasaw still showed mercy. They only killed about a dozen conquistadors and wounded a few more, but the message was sent and no Chickasaw were taken as in the other tribes in 1541. No Chickasaw were taken. So this was a clear win for the Chickasaw, a chiefdom known through his long history for prowess and warfare. Who are these Chickasaw? The Chickasaw revered as the Spartans of the lower Mississippi Valley are a chiefdom that migrated west along the Choctaw. They have been known not only as skilled warriors, but skilled negotiators, builders, and traders, quick to defend their sovereignty and freedom. This has shown itself time and time again through history, despite how inhospitable the settlers became in the Yazoo lands, today's Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. The Chickasaw were the last to see their homelands and move to the Oklahoma Territory. So this was a necessary next step in my Mississippi Kingdom series. The land that the Chickasaw inhabited in the east before removal included the Bynum Mound and Village Site near the Tombigbee drainage area. The Bynum Mound and Village Site has six burial mounds dating back to around 2,000 years ago. The two largest mounds have been restored and it's notable for copper ornaments being found at this site, as well as green stone, axe heads, lead ore, and other metal pieces that were actually imports from other areas such as Far Mound. So you see the communication between it. And then you have the Far Mound site itself, which is self-styled as the most important site in Northern Mississippi. The Far Mound site has eight large dome-shaped mounds at the site the Indians returned to over and over throughout the centuries. The round mounds, for those that don't know, are representative of the woodland mound builders. The more recent mound builders some of our ancestors were from built the flat-top Mississippian mounds that would have homes on them or the ceremonial sites. So when you see the round dome-shaped mounds, that's the woodland period mounds that they say the older period from 0 to 200 AD, 1800 years ago. And there are three woodland periods, just like it's different Mississippian periods, like the plaque mine. The three woodland periods are divided up from 3,000 to 2,200 years ago. The middle woodland period from 2,200 to 1,500 years ago. And the late woodland from 1,500 to 1,000 years ago. These lead into the more familiar cultures like the ones I've been going through the Mississippian period, the 1000 AD into the, the colonial era. The woodland era cultures did have more burial mounds, 
versus ceremonial mounds or homes, but the woodland period was a period where later technology took root. It's trade from places like Cahokia, the Great Lakes region, and down into the Yucatan took place. Technological advances took place across all the existing cultures. Everybody eventually got corn, stoneworks, and pottery. And let's not forget the addle addle. Addle addles were tools used to launch spears or darts at high velocity to cover larger distances. Now these have been used for 17,000 years. The oldest ones found in the Americas are actually dated back to 6,000 BC. And if you look, they found some 8,000 year old ones recently in a 750 pound alligator. So they're still actively finding signs of the culture here going back thousands of years. Now back to that woodland era, the woodland era is also the era where the bow and arrow, which had actually been around for a while, finally got accepted as the best weapon. For years, people used the addle addle and the bow and arrow, but eventually everybody just fell into the bow and arrow because it was faster, quieter, more accurate at long distances, and it was smaller and easier to carry. It wasn't as heavy. So the bow and arrow had a definitive advantage that led to a win against the Soto and his man in 1541 as well. And then on Chickasaw territory, you also have the Pinson Mounds, largest of the middle woodland period sites, also known for its human skull rattles found there. It's literally tons of these sites in Chickasaw territory. The take home point is this was not a scarcely populated area or a short effort. This is thousands of years, this is thousands of years of habitation and development for agriculture and civilization. This was people from multiple cultures coming together to make something special. This period is called the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. This large area, which included the territory of the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Coosa up past Cahokia and Illinois territory up into what would have been Algonquin te territory existed from around 1000 AD into the colonial area. The development and spread of the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex or the SCCC is closely tied to the Mississippian culture's wide adoption of maize agriculture and the establishment of chiefdom level complex social organizations from 1200 to 1650 CE. And this is also the period where they're seeing close connections between Mesoamerican culture and North American culture. This is something that's been debated off and on for years. I'll leave it up for you guys to decide on your own, but just for your consideration, this is when we get that bird man too. Yep, the bird man from Louisiana. The Birdman had been found depicted all the way up north in Cahokia, all the way back to 900 AD. And it obviously still has a place in the modern imagination all the way up to Mardi Gras this year. The chunky game we talked about last time with the Choctaw, the hand eye we found in Moundville, all the way to the Panther Spirit. These are all SECC concepts found from Canada all the way to the Yucatan. And if you look here, you see when they talk about what they were doing with the copper, you see all of the copper carvings that they were doing of the Birdman. And here's mentions of the underwater panther or underwater spirit. So they have the Piazza or Uctina, the panther spirit, all the way up to the Suans that are talking about this. We have the Mississippian culture, the Suan cultures all the way north to the Dagiha. There are commonalities between these cultures. You have the bird man, you have the winged serpent, all the way back to Quetzalcoatl, if you remember. So you have these shared things. That's the SCCC. Now, the bird man and the Axis Mundi, the winged serpent, all of these are found, once again, from Canada to the Yucatan. Look into it, the SCCC. So after defeating DeSoto in 1541, the Chickasaw took his iron pieces and repurposed them into weapons. They made axe heads, scrapers, and other things out of their iron pieces. Remember, the Indians were working with copper, gold, silver, and stone 
but they weren't smelting iron yet. That takes a little bit more work. So these iron pieces were valuable to the Chickasaw as tools and weapons. It actually gave them a competitive edge on their neighbors in warfare and trade because no one else had iron. And they call them celts. But when they say celts in this sense, they're talking about tools. So these are basically metal tools. Now, the Chickasaw main settlements in this period were named Yanika, Shatara, Chukariso, Hika, Tuscawilia, and Falecho. They survived well into the 1700s when James Adair, an Irish trader, came to live among the Indians. Chickasaw homes were set up in ridges or lines defensively with the Choctaw to their open back and their defensive line facing in the other direction. So if you look, these are the Chickasaw villages. This is the one that's actually closest to the Choctaw. And then you move out further towards present day Tupelo. And if you remember, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw came from west to east. So the oldest Chickasaw and Choctaw settlements are always going to be towards the west and the newer ones like the one at Ikea at Tupelo in the east are actually the younger settlements and the Chickasaw over here towards the bottom and the Chickasaw actually to the northeast of them so the open sides are to the Choctaw and the Chickasaw defensive line is facing the other way And the Chickasaw also lived in three different types of homes. These were summer houses, winter houses, and they had storage buildings. The summer houses were rectangular wattle and daub houses with porches and balconies. The winter houses were the wood frames with clay covering for insulation and the stilt houses or corn cribs were for storage. Those were built off the ground to keep people out. And just to show you real life examples, you have the large council house built in the upper left. You have the corn crib on the right. You have the summer crib on the bottom and the winter house on the bottom. Now, the importance of oral tradition was held in high regard. Long before the written word, Indians, including the Chickasaw, respected the honored keepers of the flame. Just like with the Choctaw, the elders tell the stories around the fire. The Chickasaw have a story of a first mound built by the crawfish that was the beginning of all life on land. They also have the story of the brothers Choctaw and Chickasaw coming from the west to the east, like I just said. The importance of being the keeper of the stories cannot be understated. It's an honor among honors. And once you're given the responsibility to carry on those stories, it's your responsibility to keep them and hand those to the next generation. And among those, you have the stories of Abba Benli, he who sits or dwells above, also called Inki Abu, under Christian influence, father above. There were ancient beliefs in a multitude of celestial powers, and there were four beloved things above. The clouds, the sun, the clear sky, and he that lives in the clear sky. It's believed that Abba Binli lived above the clouds and on earth with the unpolluted people. He is the sole creator of warmth, light, and all animal and vegetable life. The Chickasaw worshiped Abba Binli in smoking cloud, believing him to reside above the clouds and in the elements of the holy fire. Lightning and thunder were called Heloha, and this rumbling noise roar. When it rained, thunder and strong winds blew for a long time. The beloved or holy people were thought to be at war above in the clouds. Many Chickasaw used to fire off their guns and point them at the sky at such times. This was to show that the warriors were not afraid to die so they could aid the holy people. Fire was very much respected by the ancestors. Trees were dead in and later used to keep an annual holy fire burning, just like the Olympic fire. It was unlawful and considered the work of evil to extinguish even the cooking fire with water. You would let it burn out. And also integral to the culture are the games. You have chonky, which is a purely American sport. Chonky, also known as a hoop and stick game, 
is a traditional Indian sport. And I'm gonna tell y'all it's hard with origins dating back to 600 AD in the Cahokia region near present day St. Louis, Missouri. This game, which has similarities to sports like shuffleboard or bulky ball, was played across much of North America, all the way down in the Mississippi, especially in the Southeastern region, and involved rolling a dish shape shown across the ground while players attempted to land their spears or sticks as close as possible to the stone's final resting place. Chunky, just like stick ball, was and still is a great way to resolve conflicts and hold spiritual and cultural significance. And then you have E.T. Kapachali, stick ball, the little brother of war. It's another game that's been handed down for generations. It's historically been played to settle conflicts over land and politics. There are three types of stick ball. The social game played between men and women for fun. The ceremonial game, the rougher one, played only with men played east to west. And the third one invented by the Mississippi band when men and women played in the field. Either way, it can be fun, but it's also been very serious at times. These traditional games have started dying off, but they're seeing a revival recently with modern returns to the traditional ways of living in cultures, and I'm happy to see it. And another fortunate thing about the Chickasaw is they were able to keep their clans in order. The Choctaw lost their clan system over the years when they got to Oklahoma and through the Trail of Tears. The Chickasaw clan system is still intact, however. The Chickasaw culture is also matrilineal, not matriarchal, to correct that one. You belong to the clan of your mother, and your mother's brothers and sisters teach you about the nature of your clan. You also wouldn't marry inside of your clan to avoid inbreeding. So once again, we have a well-established culture. So how did colonization affect the Chickasaw? And if you want, feel free to take a look at the descriptions of these clans. The raccoon, the bird, the gator, the deer, the panther, the wildcat, the fish, the fox, the skunk, the squirrel, and the wolf. So to start off, we have something called the Southeastern Shatter Zone. This is what they use to describe what happened in Mississippian culture. What that means is the interactions that happened in this area were felt for hundreds of miles around. The Indian slavery, the diseases, the overall interruption in the way of life in Mississippian culture changed the entire course of the people occupying the immediate region and far away for hundreds of miles for over a hundred years. This is not just geography, it's social, cultural, and political. From what the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Creek experience, but the Tamuqua, the Shawnee, the Catawba, the Yuchi, the Coosa, the Westo, the Hopi, everybody. In the end, not one tribe, chiefdom, or confederacy was not affected by colonization. So that term, Shatter Zone, is extremely appropriate for this. The breakdown of the existing culture and remapping of everything, the people having to pick up the pieces after a big bull came around through the shop. So even though the Chickasaw definitely experienced the coming of DeSoto, the Chickasaw in particular was stronger because of what they went through with DeSoto, because now they got iron. They had iron when nobody else did, and they lost the village, but not one they were really using and they kept above all their reputation of being unconquerable. They also ended up with more territory due to other groups dispersing and more warriors with those dispersed tribes coming into the Chickasaw, the Shakshuma, the Kusa and others. So into the English. Now I'm not going to go into what the English did in the East. Remember, my focus is each group by itself. That's the only way in my opinion to understand the various chiefdoms, tribes, and nations' decisions is through their own experiences. So specifically concerning the Chickasaw, they were able to defeat DeSoto and they were already known as great warriors, traders, and negotiators. So over a hundred years later, enter the British. Now remember, 
by the time the British get this far inland, they already know who's who in the general sense. They already had Indian wars with the Powhatan. They already had Indian alliances with the Iroquois and other nations and chiefdoms. So by the time the British are introduced to the Chickasaw chiefdom, they already had a play mapped out. They knew the Chickasaw and Choctaw were the strong players west of the Appalachians. So crossing land, going through the territories of the Carolinas, crossing through Cherokee territory, Catawba territory, when the British reached the Chickasaw territory, they had a deal for the Chickasaw. Either get down or get laid down. Either start a trade with the British to put it nice, or the British would go around them and they would start a trade with the Choctaw. Now the Chickasaw Mikos knew exactly what that meant. This was an edge in military technology for the Choctaw versus the edge for the Chickasaw. And this could mean to the superiority of the area. So now, starting in the 1617s, the Chickasaw are now actively protecting and trading with the British over in the Carolinas. And it stayed that way for over 100 years. So at the beginning of this cycle, after the settling of Virginia and the Carolina colonies, the Chickasaw started trading with the British. When they were establishing the Carolinas, these trade networks were linked by urban centers of trade, which allowed exchange between them. These centers became trading houses, forts, and the colonies that coalesced around them. So these exotic materials were often used as a way to convey a person's status or authority. Copper, quartz, mica, galena, and pyrite. And you can't forget the gold and the silver and the deer skins. Indians of that era, especially the Chickasaw and the Cherokee, would die over their skins. The Tulos, Okanichis, Tuscarora, and Catawba brought British goods to people as far inland as the Cherokees in the mountains and the creeks into the Alabamas and the Chickasaw and the Choctaw along the Mississippi River. So this was an era of great prosperity if you had something to trade, which unfortunately eventually did turn into prisoners of war. So before we go any further, if you guys hadn't noticed, I was getting in the habit of putting out a video every week. This one took me a little bit longer, even though this is research I did years ago. I had to go back into it. But those of y'all that have been around back in 2021 when I did the first couple of Mississippi videos, the Chickasaw, and in particular the tribes that became known as the Creek and the Cherokee, this history gets real complicated. It's understandable for someone who understands the politics of these groups, but I spent months trying to figure out how to explain this to people. To be honest, for my personal purposes, I could have stopped at the, the Choctaw or over east at the Mataponi or the Catawba or even some Irish history, but I listen to you guys and I hear you. So I figured I'm a sucker for an honest question and I would run down the Mississippi first. It's a lot of people interested in these areas, this shatter zone and how it was shattered. How these people could, for the most part, live, but the culture be changed so much and the lands be pretty much changed permanently. How did this happen? So this tribe, the Chickasaw, a hugely important it is because they traded off and on with the English and the French and had no problem conquering or kidnapping other tribes. So here we go. And you know I have to touch on the European part. So now we have to start with King Charles II of Spain, the Habsburg King. This was fun research. First thing that came up for me was a mystery of why his head was full of water, hydrocephaly. So if you look at the left, you see why. He was inbred at least seven ways. Now because of this, he suffered from multiple abnormalities, the one he's most known for being that Habsburg chin. So not only that, he wasn't able to have children. So with this, the Spanish Empire, which at the time was the area we would call Spain, Spanish Netherlands, Naples, Sicily, Milan, Eastern France, Peru, the Philippines, the Moroccan Presidios, and Iran and Algeria, this man had no family, no children. So this became the war of ascension to the throne between the House of Bourbon and the House of Habsburg. Now remember, De Tonti, this was the same type of issue that made his family move from Naples to France. So the immediate cause was Charles II 
being aware of his weakness, not only in himself, but of the continual inbreeding in these Habsburgs. So he knew that it was more important for the Spanish Empire to have a strong leader than it was to just have a Habsburg name on the throne. Charles II, as he got older, he began to fall under the influence of the French factions in the Spanish court who recommended Philip of Anjou, who he wrote to succeed him in his will. But the Austrian Habsburgs further north obviously considered themselves the rightful heirs to this huge Spanish empire. Keep in mind, they had an Austrian king that was a Habsburg as well as a Spanish king that was a Habsburg. So Europe found itself at war over these thrones. So the settlers here all of a sudden began attacking each other as well. Remember, it's more English here to the tune of tens of thousands, but the French have entrenched themselves militarily as well as have intimated themselves into the tribes at this point. The Algonquin to the north got French in them down to the Quapaw and the Choctaw. At this point in history, before the Natchez Wars, the Natchez, the Chitimacha, and others are also dealing with the French. So this was a purely European conflict that began to take on an Indian face in America. Enter Joseph Blake and others like him, an Englishman born out of an early Protestant family who dissented from the Church of England in the 1600s. This movement was called the Nonconformists, if you hadn't heard of it. Now, these guys came over to the Americas in the early 1680s, and once they were in the Carolinas, he was able to get involved in politics and ended up owning at least five plantations by 1690. So Joey finds himself in political power in the Carolinas after the Yamasee War, which finds tens of thousands of Indians going into slavery as prisoners of war from this one conflict alone. See, that's why this lecture took longer than the others, because this is the point where the English and the French history connects. Now, the English history would take at least five lectures alone to go through the Pequot Wars, the Powhatan Wars, the Iroquois, the Algonquin, Metacomet. God forbid we go into Spanish Florida, but just to tell you guys, that's what I'm here for. We'll get there, but that's going to be separate videos. But to go into these conflicts a bit, because the Chickasaw would definitely trade the Indian POW slaves in these conflicts. This is a Yamasi war. As it says here, the only way to even understand these conflicts is from an economic perspective and a few others. It became a competition for European goods amongst Indians. Also, if you look in the bottom left, they discuss how the very beginning in the Carolinas, the plan was to create a full Indian militia to protect the colony's interests internally and abroad. They also mentioned the Tuscarora War and how they sent Yamasi, Cherokee, Catawba, and Appalachian Indians to destroy the Tuscarora, which they almost did. But, uh, but fortunately, there are still Tuscarora and Yamasi alive to this day that can discuss these conflicts. The truth is complicated. The truth is slaves are all kinds, prisoners of war, indentured servants of all kinds, masters of all kinds, planters of all kinds, farmers of all kinds. This is why you can't have these type of conversations with broad brushes. So as you see here in South Carolina, at least 25% of the slaves can prove to be of Indian descent. Then you get into the fact that these were the numbers they actually tried to hide for tax purposes because when they brought over the Africans, the crown could tax for those, English, French, or otherwise. But when they were enslaving Indians, those were not taxed. Indian not taxed. But the Indian slaves that were captured that were not taxed, they were sold into other colonies. And then on paper, they would be documented as something as other than what they are. So you would catch a Tuscarora, or Yamasi, or something like that, and a, they would never go down as Indian, and you would trade them into a different territory like Pennsylvania, or they would end up in Spain or something like that. It's no telling what these Indians would end up be listed as on paper. So the only true way to trace these roots is through these oral stories, through grandma and grandfather. 
these stories that are handed down in your family, no book can tell you who you are. You have to talk to your people and we need to start recording these oral stories. And then if you look here in the right column, they discuss how they would put the English traders among the Indian groups to incite them to violence against their Indians to perpetrate the Indian slave trade. Then you have just flat out debt. You know, people are terrible with credit. Same thing applies here. And we'll get back to similar situations with the video on the Yazoo land for all, when the tribes went into debt. The only way to pay off that debt was to sell land to traders, sell skins, or sell people. Lines of credit, greed, and anger. This is how you conquer the unconquerable from inside the mind. Look towards the bottom on the right where it says we have this meteoric rise of military slave in societies. Heavily armed groups like the Yamasi, the Westo, the Yuchi, the Savannah, and the Chickasaw. So we go forward 10 years and back to Mr. Blake. Post the Yamasi War, post the Tuscarora War, all these issues in the 13 colonies, and now we move west into the Mississippis. Mississippian territory, we have these French forts and we have French Indian allies and Spanish Indian allies. Don't forget we have Spanish Florida. So the English colonists are trying to extend their influence south and west where these slave capturing runs are weakening the Tamuqua and inland west now, even though Appalachians were helping them, they're capturing the Appalachian and they're selling the Appalachian to slavery too. Sitting right in the middle of this territory, you have the Ogmogi and the Oconee, and the settlers set up shop right in the middle of them. So among friendly Indians, these colonists in what are at the time the New Carolina, South Carolina, are trading deer skins and Indian slaves. The Yamasi are selling Tamuquins from Spanish Florida to the English into the lower 13, and the inland Indians are being traded in the Appalachians. But the numbers of those Indians are thinning out, so the Raiders are getting guns and returning military power, but they're having to reach out further and further. That's how they end up in Chickasaw and Cherokee territory, and eventually Choctaw territory. And here the government people are the same as the traders. They say the traders and the government are identical, same people. So as capitalism does, all of a sudden, these people making the most wins in these trades are starting to monopolize these trades and these alliances. This is when these Carolinians started having thoughts of an American imperialism instead of English imperialism. This is the beginning of ideas of an American empire. So now with the war of Spanish secession, overseas between the Habsburgs and the Bourbons, the Spanish and the English colonists are at dispute and the Indians are caught in the middle of soldiers and slaves as police and possession. So here we have another concern entering the French. So the English have been centered in Altamaha territory, but other traders had established their trading posts among the Alabama, Tallapalooza and others entering what would today be Alabama. Now we have Chickasaw alliances being established. The English are using the Chickasaw to keep the French from controlling the whole Mississippi Valley, going all the way back. If you look at MK3 in the Quapaw in 1698, when the English started setting up shop towards Arkansas and saw how entrenched the French were, they realized they had to break it up. The key was the Chickasaw. And you have a couple of explorers, Welch and Dodsworth, who only were allowed that far west by traveling through Chickasaw territory. That was the only friendly territory they had. And with the arrival of pack horses, they were able to extend even further because now they don't have to carry anything by hand or by crates and barrels. And then we have the entrance of Bienville into Mississippi Valley. Now keep in mind, Bienville is Iberville's brother. When you go back and see everything Iberville did, Think of Benville being there to witness it too, or at the very least having firsthand access to Iberville's info. So these guys are a concerted effort to maintain or extend French influence. It's documented that when Bienville finally got to the Louisiana territory, 
one of his first memories was the Chickasaw in Louisiana with English guns doing Indian raids. So as we get to these wars, remember, he tried to unite the Indians under the French, but he failed. We can speculate why, and I hear people doing that all the time. We can debate on this value, good or bad, but first you have to at least know what happened. He definitely failed with the French-Indian relations, but he kept it going for a while. Also considering again, the Choctaw outnumbered the Chickasaw to the tune of thousands at least. The Choctaw are mostly in Mississippi as it relates to today's discussion. I know it was also Choctaw to the west of the Great River, and also remember their Eastern and Western Division Choctaw, Oklatonopolo and Okafalaya. So the French always at this time in history tried to address the Choctaw and Chickasaw together as two large polities in the area. The Chickasaw are the key to weakening the French in the Mississippi Valley. Now to step back in the Indian Territory, the Natchez War started happening. We have open conflict between the Choctaw on the French side and the Chickasaw on the English side. And all the alliances that start diving into this territory, the Quapaw, the Illinois Confederacy, the French, the Cherokee, the Shashuma, English. The Choctaw outnumbered the Chickasaw by thousands, but the Chickasaw had a military advantage with the guns. But that was equalized when the Choctaw got guns from the French. And then there's still open raids going in both directions, capturing prisoners of war. So at this point, I'm going to hope you guys go back and take a look at MK5, the Choctaw, MK4, the Natchez. Then you'll understand we got some deep animosity here. And if you want to take a look, once again, you have these Chickasaw villages. And these are some of the Choctaw villages of the time. They call it French period. And you also see Kusa, Okaloosa, Yanabe, and other people amongst here. So in early 1700, you have open hostility. And right in the middle of it, these traders are just coming and going. Welch and Dysworth, Nairn, running routes through in Indian territory. Even Detante, who we spoke about in MK3, the Quapaw, Thunderarm made his run at the Chickasaw. So the Chickasaw, just like certain players in the Choctaw, like Red Shoes, are trying to play both sides. Everybody is thinking their side is going to come out on top. And in 1720, it very well might have looked that way. Everybody talking big, everybody making big promises, but who can you trust? That's the one thing that came and stayed was them slave raids. And every time you look at these maps, I need you to not take it for granted. This is land surveyors during wartime. These traders, these surveyors, all of these roles add up to information gathering and reconnaissance. I need y'all to see that. So at the end of the war of Spanish secession, we have Philip of Anjou on the throne in Spain, but the larger Spanish empire, which was previously Los Reyes Catholicos, the Catholic Kings, like we talked about MK3, post Alhambra decree and the capitulation in Granada in 1492 by Mohammed XII of Granada is now broken up forever. Now this affected Spanish Florida heavily. This definitely affected Nueva España, but the Louisiana territory wasn't really affected because it was French. But with the Treaty of Utrecht, the English did gain Acadia, which became Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and the Hudson Bay region. But the official war is over. This is never gonna end in Indian territory. This is life now. The Chickasaw keep going with slave and raids, even though they're already harboring Natchez and other Indians that are in their territory because they were pushed out of their territory. I've already thoroughly gone through the Natchez as one example, but then you also got the Shashuma, the Yazoo, the Tapalusa, the Okapalisa. This happened time and again. Tribes merging into other tribes or dividing into different groups. So the Chickasaw are seeing consequences of slave trading, but they're still trading with the French. So it shouldn't be surprising to you that Iberville incites the Choctaw and their Indian allies to a full war against the Chickasaw. Remember from MK5, Iberville had made great inwards with the Choctaw. They were trading, living among them, and assimilating, going both ways. This is how you end up with French Indians and Indian Christians. 
So even when times got thin for the French provisions, a lot of the Choctaw fashion stayed loyal to the French due to the family ties. This is when you get issues like what happened with red shoes. Some factions, when provisions got low, they would go trade with the English or even the Spanish. Consider the Choctaw and Chickasaw fighting, but this is Indian territory, Mississippi and Alabama, so the English aren't even recording these battles because it's not an English territory. But as you see on the right, the French are not only aware of it, but Iberville is claiming responsibility for causing it. He's claiming 400 kills and 100 prisoners off top. This is when you get the Squirrel King, Fanny Minko. Now, he had this idea of moving further west into what would be known as modern day Tennessee to get closer to the English allies. And he created maps of this area like this one we have, and he used them as capital to trade to the English. The Squirrel King gave the English maps of Indian territory. If you look on here, you see the English, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Cherokee. If all my sticklers are semantics, this is 1723. In 1707, when English and Scotland joined, this is when you start using the term British. I'll be seeing y'all in the comments talking about is it the English or the British? In 1723, it's British. So this Squirrel King hands the governor of South Carolina a layout of the land all the way down to Texas. Please don't misunderstand them though. This is still Amico Amico's. Squirrel King was known for his prowess in battle. He was known to kill more men than anyone during this time and also being a great orator and strategist. So you have to think, if a man of this caliber thought it was time to get away from the Choctaw and the French, he might have put some thought into it. Plus remember the Chickasaw villages originally were not built to defend against the Choctaw. Their defensive front was actually in the opposite direction, friendly to the Choctaw. So I would say he might have made the right decision to protect the Chickasaw by moving out of those early villages. And this map not only show how much the Chickasaw knew about Indian territory, but also how much value the British could have in continuing to build relations with the Chickasaw. This is how the British begin to understand the Mississippi and Alabama territories. We got to put respect on his name, Fani Minko. All right, now this map showed the British the lay of the land from Cahokia. Now you remember, you read some sources, they talked like Cahokia was this long ago far away thing. The Chickasaw still listed Cahokia in the 1600s as an active place. Squirrel King mapped Kaskakia, Anishinaabeg, the Illini, the Creek, the Cherokee, all of it. Remember, all the way back to Mississippi Kingdom 2 and 3, the rivers. Squirrel King mapped out the river systems. Mississippi, Ohio, Wabash, and Tennessee rivers and their river systems and by relationship to the Chickasaw, not distance. So this is a quality primary source that shows how active and interconnected the, in the Indian world was. And the British really needed this. They had gotten as far as a quapaw, but no further west. And also this shows how the Indian world was changing. Remember the Creeks in 1723 were not calling themselves Creeks, but the merging of all the tribes was actively happening at this time. To the point that Squirrel King could see what was happening and they had already started calling them Creeks. Also remember there was Overhill, Cherokee, and the Yawea, Kitwa, and we can't forget about the Georgia Cherokee like the Etowa. These two maps are Cherokee territory, just looking forward to MK7. These were all separate in this area of time. So this is a period when the tribes and chiefdoms were actively becoming nations. Just like this is the same period, England and Scotland became Britain and Los Reyes Catalicos, the Spanish empire was changing shape into what we would eventually call Spain. So some empires were getting big and some empires were being broken down. 1723 was active. The British saw this in 1723 and realized the task of American imperialism that they had set forth for themselves was going to be a big task. So after Squirrel King moves further east, the village of Yannica, as is seen here, gets attacked and wiped out. Diver Bill wasn't aware that thousands of the Chickasaw had already moved towards Tennessee with the Squirrel King. 
the French and Choctaw destroyed the remember of the Yannicka, and it was definitely a huge loss of life, but not as large as it would have been if Squirrel King hadn't moved, and not as large as Iberville thought. No, he says here 800 men. There were thousands of Chickasaw that went east into Tennessee. So as a dare rise, now the French are looking at continuing wiping out Chickasaw Head and East. They're looking at Hegha and Shatara. After Yannicka fell, the people in Chukafara moved east too. So they're abandoning their old territory in the west and they're pushing east. The English are also helping the Chickasaw build their defenses, including building the Chickasaw Forts. Then we get again to the Natchez Wars, which the French blame squarely on the Chickasaw. I think I'm gonna try that whole YouTube link thing because these topics are all interconnected. Either way, MK4 Natchez, remember the Natchez raided that French Fort Rosalie that the French made build them. After these Natchez found their way to Falacho, one of the last active English sites in the region, the French wanted to destroy the Chickasaw, but they never could, especially after turning on their Indian allies and destroying the Chouchers. So even when you look at the Natchez Revolt and Natchez Wars, they kind of fell into a situation where these conflicts are all connected and it's difficult to draw separations between them. The Natchez Wars are usually attributed between 1716 and 1731, but we're talking about a campaign to commit genocide. The French are scared, expecting continuing Indian warfare, and the Choctaw are now actively at war with the Chickasaw literally relatives this is why we ended up having the choctaw civil war and the french and choctaw developed so many enemies that end up allied with the british betrayal of fellow american indians family the french extinguished the chocha indians just to prove a point at the same point the chickasaw chieftain wasn't united against the choctaw even while the Natchez were coming into the Chickasaw territory, there were still conversations about the Choctaw being unhappy with the French and the Chickasaw being unhappy with the English. Remember, these are supposed to be trade agreements. These trade agreements have blossomed out to full war. This is what we left off at the MK5, the Choctaw, where Red Shoes is back doing with the English trying to get his own treaty out of Charleston, which eventually would get him killed, and a whole lot of Choctaw sent to the British West Indies as prisoners of war after the Battle of Kiev. Now remember, these are the colonial times, so even though the Choctaw are trying new tactics and they're gaining success, you get this winter of 34, and the English are planning settlements in Alabama, which is a first for them to try to build in French territory if we want to take that view of it. But if we take an Indian view of this, all of these people are encroaching on old Indian territories, but they are staying out of French ceremonial lands. They're staying out of the important places, which the French were actually the first to violate when Commander Shepard of the French moved into a Natchez graveyard. So these are land disputes. Now, the French, a.k.a. the administrator of New France, Bienville at this point, are trying to avoid another attack after the war with Natchez, but King Louis wants to wipe out the Chickasaw, and soon. So Bienville is waffling about his position when the Chickasaw attack a boat coming down the Mississippi from Illinois. So Bienville concedes on his reluctance to attack the Chickasaw again, and he approves the Battle of Akia. Remember, Red Shoes tells him this is a good idea. So as Red Shoes gathers a Choctaw, Major Dutarjay brings in his French regiment soldiers and they start making their way to Chickasaw territory to Akia in February of 1736, but he makes a couple stops on the way. Let's call him D. D stopped at Chickasaw Bluffs where the French have a fort called Fort Pruhome and some more Indian allies. The Choctaw basically decided not to be allies at that. Just to put a face on it, he was in the Ohio Valley, so nine out of ten times it was either Illinois or Quapaw who didn't show up. So on the March 5th, he takes off and they reach Ikea on March 24th. Now, four days before Bienville tried to tell him not to attack to wait till October, but he decided on his own to attack Agula Chitoka. On the next day, on March 25th of 1736, over 400 Chickasaw came out and surrounded his whole force, which was less than 400, and on enemy territory and tired from walking. 
all these Indians with the major ran off and left him. And as he tried to leave and run, him and at least 40 other people died. RIP to Major D. The Chickasaw had this habit, you see, of burning their enemies on the stake when they caught them. Now, in the process of this, the Chickasaw recovered the letters that were written down between the Major and Bienville down in Louisiana, and the Chickasaw went to confront them over that. So the French are already short on artillery because they can't get it across the water. We can talk about the war of Polish succession that was going on at the time. We could talk about pirates. Either way, the French was always undersupplying his colonies. So even after the Battle of Gula Chitoka, after the loss of so many French and Indian soldiers, it made no sense for the French to go directly into another battle. But they did. In the rain, 600 men, French, Indian, and African, go to attack the Chickasaw. Red Shoes, the Alabama Minko, Bienville himself. They all went to try to attack the Chickasaw on their home territory on the Tombigbee River. Now, Bienville made it out alive, but this definitely was a turning point for the French success in America. They tried to attack again, failed in pump fate, all the way up to 1740, where all new captain De Blainville. Now, De Blainville, he attempted another approach on Akia one more time, and he eventually conceded and decided to negotiate. The Choctaw forces and Chickasaw forces, they were both weakened by 20 plus years of back and forth. The French got a big old hole in them with a debt of million livres and the Natchez safe and sound with the Chickasaw. Just to let you know, there are still Natchez among the Chickasaw to this day. The Chickasaw and Choctaw kept raiding each other for years, even past the death of Red Shoes in 1747. This cost the lives of thousands of Indians, French and Africans. So to answer the question, how do you conquer the unconquerable? You don't, you stall them out. The Chickasaw and Choctaw continue warring with each other and other tribes. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the Cherokee or the Creek yet, right? Once again, I'm just setting up for the French Indian War, the American Revolution and the War of 1812. These conflicts take on a whole different meaning in Indian territory. But hopefully you guys check out those videos too when they drop, right? Look out for me. Just as I finished this up, I thought this was interesting for those who take the time and look at these areas I discussed. In the Mississippi Provincial Archives on page 311, where they talk about this, I did find where they say that the Indians that were at Ogula Chitoka that were with the Tarje. What's interesting is I found that they were talking about Cahokia and Kaskakia like they were still active entities at the time. Now, if you know, you know that they've been saying that these places have been abandoned since the 14, 1500s. But remember what Cahokia represents, especially in comparison to Moundville. These places were still occupied up until this time documented in the Mississippi Provincial Archives. This site can still be visited up to today near Tupelo, Mississippi, called the Chickasaw Village and Fort site. Now, my first instinct was to put up some video from this site, but my videos come out choppy. For everybody watching, if y'all want me to start putting these videos back in like the other ones, just let me know. Comment, let me know what you thought about this one. I tried a couple of new things on it. Got the new mic running and everything. So if y'all wind enough, I will put the videos back in. This site is two miles from the site of the Battle of Tupelo and a lot of other sites in Mississippi. I feel like the more people who show interest in these Mississippi and Alabama sites, the more we can get attention on this American history. Moundville, Pinson, the whole Natchez Trace. It makes no sense. We all live amongst all this history and we just drive past it every day. Now, let's get out there and see your neighborhood. All right, y'all, that's my time. Hope you enjoy NK6, the Chickasaw. If you haven't figured it out, I'm basically introducing all the players to set up for later work and answering questions I hear from people the whole way. I hear a lot of people trying to understand the creator stories, the culture. I didn't go through the pottery much on this one because I felt like it was so much more to fill it out. We got copper pieces, addle addles, wars, and to be honest, I had to decide where to stop. 
it's so much more but i can't keep y'all here too long i gotta keep y'all tuning in to the new videos i'll see you later